Good evening, everyone. Today is World Stroke Day, the 29th October 2021. And on this Stroke Day, as we are already aware that how important is this topic. And for that, we are going to meet at this Stroke Summit today. Before we start the proceedings, the scientific proceedings of this evening, let me introduce you to my company, Mankind Pharma. So I am Dr. Prashant. I'm a medical advisor for Mankind Pharma, which is serving life in pharma, Indian pharmaceutical industry since 1995. Our chairman, Mr. R.C. Juneda, had a vision, and still this vision is going on to become the most admired Indian pharma company. Keeping that vision in, in mind, and also the name Mankind, which is serving life, we salute to the true heroes of Mankind. And if for, for this purpose, we donated one day salary, each of mankind's employee donated one day of salary to the PM Cares Fund for COVID warriors. Also, I would like to share this information that Mankind Pharma is India's number one pharmaceutical company prescription wise, and by value, it is ranked four. We have presence in more than 34 countries and more than 300 products to our name and more than 13 regulatory bodies approvals. We have 19 world-class US FD and WHO GMP compliant manufacturing units as well. As I was saying, during this COVID second wave also, we pay our respect with our rupees 100 crore contribution to all those families who have lost their members during this COVID, whether they are healthcare workers, they are policemen, they are pharmacists. So all those are covered with this 100 crore contribution. Also, in the field of research and development, as Mankind Pharma is now taking, pay, uh, taking, uh, taking a pace, and with the global patent of first-in-class novel anti-diabetic molecule targeting GPR-119. We have already started phase one trial for this molecule. Now with this, let me introduce you to our distinguished speakers of this evening. Dr. Nitin K. Sethi, who is Associate Professor of Neurology at New York Presbyterian Hospital and Vail Cornell Medical Center, New York, USA. He is board certified neurologist and director and chief coordinator Brain Care Foundation. He is also director Vail Cornell Concussion and Brain Care Center. They're also diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He's also a diplomat American Board of Clinical Neurophysiology. Welcome, sir. Now, second speaker of this evening, Dr. Tiny Naya, sir, who is head Department of Cardiology at PRS Hospital, Srivendram. He's also recipient of Best Doctor Award by Government of Kerala. He has been awarded Most Inspiring Doctor of India Award by Economic Times. He's also editorial board advisory member of various reputed journals, Indian Heart Journal, European Journal of Heart Failure, Indian Edition. He's also member of the CSI Hypertension Council. Welcome, sir. So with this, I hand over this session to Dr. Sethi. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Can I, can I share my screen? Uh, please do, sir. Uh, well, I want to thank Dr. Prashant Agarwal and, and everybody at Mankind Pharma for inviting me to speak to you today on World Stroke Day. Uh, it's indeed a big honor for me and a privilege. Uh, I got to, know Dr., got to know Dr. Nair before the start of this talk, so it's again a privilege to be sharing the same stage with him. And today is World Stroke Day, so what I'll attempt to do with Dr. Nair Nair is to try to give you a broad overview of stroke, a little bit of what's the extent of the problem, how do we kind of go about diagnosing stroke, because I've been told by Dr. Prashant Agrawal that the audience is a mixed audience, we are not all neurologists here, we all come from different specialities, so I'll try to keep my talk relatively simple, and then I'll dwell a little bit more into the management of a stroke, and then 
I'll leave and Dr. Nair is going to take over and he's going to handle it from the cardiology side. So I hope by the end of our talks, uh, the audience will get a pretty good idea about stroke and what's the, what's the extent of this problem in India. And I have titled my talk, Stroke, Lest We Forget the Other 97%. And I'll try to tell you why I've written this uh, strange heading about the other 97%. Who are these people? So when we talk about stroke, some things which are simple, a definition of stroke. So if you look at the WHO definition of stroke, it's defined as a focal or global disturbance of brain function with symptoms lasting 24 hours or longer. And the cause is a vascular cause. That's the whole thing. Stroke is a vascular disease of the brain. The, the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association define stroke as the sudden onset of a neurological deficit. So there's something which suddenly happens, a neurological deficit comes up. It's again attributed to a focal injury of the brain, that's a CNS, which remember stroke can occur in the brain, it can occur in the spinal cord, it can occur in the eye, the retina. And again, the cause is a vascular cause. Now we also talk about TIA or transient ischemic attack. What is a TIA? What's the definition of a TIA? So in 2009, the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association basically propose that a TIA is a transient episode of neurological dysfunction. It's caused by a focal brain, spinal cord, or retinal ischemia. And again, the main dif difference is tra it's transient. The patient comes back to baseline as compared to a stroke, which leads to an acute infarction and a, a part of the brain does not recover. So how common is this problem? Now, one thing which we'll, which we'll get by the end of the talk is stroke is a common disease. One in four people are affected by a stroke over their lifetime. It's nowadays thought to be between second and third leading cause of death. You have coronary artery disease, you have cancer, stroke is right up there. It's one of the leading causes of disability in adults worldwide. If you look at the United States, I'm in New York City. It's about... Uh, 10.30 in the morning here. Again, the prevalence of stroke, if you look at this slide, varies. Uh, it's equally prevalent in males and females. But there's a little bit of, of uh, you know, distinction when you look at different races. So when you look at white males versus and white females, you'll see black males, African-American males, and African-American females will have a higher prevalence of stroke as compared to other populations that are there in, in, in United States. Now, when you're looking at India, there have been a, a number of studies which now have been done in big cities in India, Chennai, uh, Bangalore, Trivandrum, Ludhiana. The problem with these studies is when you look at them is the catchment population is not clearly defined. What, what population are we studying? Are we looking at just the rural population? Are we looking at population which is the urban population, educated, non-educated? What's the catchment area? The, the studies are slightly all over the place with that, but the thing which stands out, that stroke is very common in India. The cumulative incidence of stroke ranges from 105 to 152 per 100,000 persons per year. And what we really find out is that, uh, that the incidence of stroke in a country like India, which we'll call as a developing country, uh, a middle, low to middle income country, is as high as the incidence of stroke, or if not higher than the incidence of stroke in high income countries. So I got this slide from Hindustan Times, lest we forget, I, I will keep coming back to this, uh, this, uh, this phrase. We need to understand that stroke is common in India. When you look at worldwide, 20 million people suffer from stroke every year. It causes about 5 million deaths. A lot of people, 5 million people are rendered disabled because of the stroke. One in six a persons get a, gets a stroke in his or her lifetime. India is no different. 1.5 million people suffer from strokes every year. About 3,000 to 4,000 Indians suffer from stroke every day. And nowadays, stroke causes more death in our country in India than diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV combined. So as we are a mixed bag of specialities here, some basis of stroke, broadly speaking, you can divide a stroke into an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. So, as you can see in this diagram, an ischemic stroke is when a large blood vessel of the brain 
either the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery gets blocked by a clot. And a lot of times this clot comes from the heart. It's a cardioembolic stroke. And Dr. Nair, who's going to follow me, is going to probably talk a lot about this. So that's basically a common ischemic stroke involving, involving a large vessel of the brain. Strokes can be hemorrhagic, where a, small, a smaller penetrating blood vessel ruptures and causes leakage of blood in the brain. When you talk about ischemic strokes, the TOAST classification gives you five subdivisions of ischemic stroke. So you can, have, you can divide this ischemic stroke into a five subdivisions. You can have a large artery thrombotic stroke. So this is a stroke which is involving a large artery of the brain, like the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery. Usually the cause is atherosclerotic disease leading to ischemia and infarction. That accounts for about 20% of all strokes. You can have strokes involving the small penetrating arteries of the brain. They are again thrombotic. They are referred to commonly as lacunar strokes. And again, they account for about 25% of all ischemic strokes. You can have strokes which are cardioembolic, and usual causes are cardiac arrhythmias, valvular heart disease, patent foramen ovale, thromba in the left ventricles. Dr. Nair is going to probably talk a lot about this, so I'm not going to dwell into it but that accounts for about 15% of the strokes. Strokes can be cryptogenic. So there's a, there's a big category of stroke, which will be cryptogenic. Cryptogenic basically means in spite of all the workup you do, you cannot identify the exact cause of the stroke. Cause is unknown. Is it a PFO? Is it something else? We don't know about it. And strokes can be secondary to other causes such as illicit drug use. Again, that whole, you can probably include about 20% of strokes, which will be causes of secondary causes of stroke. Now, before we go further into ischemic stroke, let's not forget subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a type of a stroke, except usually in a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, the cause is a rupture of a saccular aneurysm in the brain. So a blood vessel again ruptures. Again, it's a vascular cause, and it leads to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, moving on to assessment of a stroke. How do you assess a patient has had a stroke? Now, it's very important that we try to determine what, is, what kind of stroke has occurred. You may ask why, because that will determine the treatment. So in the emergency room here in the casualty in India, you know, this, if you are the stroke physician, if you are a doctor who's looking after the patient, you'll ask the patient, when did the symptoms of the stroke first start? Now, the time of onset is very critical because that determines what treatment is given. So we really need to play emphasis and try to determine the exact onset of the stroke symptoms. You know, you do a focused review of the patient's history, especially concentrating on the cardiovascular and the cerebrovascular history, do a rapid and focused physical and neurological examination, identify what neurological deficits is the patient having. You request appropriate blood tests, like for example, you're going to ask for the CBC, you're going to ask for the coagulation parameters, platelet count, PT, prothrombin time, thromboplastin time, INR, because that again might, might be needed for treatment. And then the role of imaging, I'm going to talk a little bit more after this, but the role of imaging is very important. Do you order a CT scan of the head? What about the MRI? In our hospital, you know, it's an EHR, electronic uh, medical record. The resident will just order it's called as an MRI acute stroke protocol or a brain attack protocol. It basically includes, you know, an MRI of the brain with and without contrast, an MRI of the head and an MRI of the neck. So pretty much we look at all the blood vessels of the brain. Now, we perform a quick assessment of the degree of the patient's neurological deficit. So does the patient have any speech deficit? Is there any aphasia? Is there any spatial perception defect, any hemifacial neglect? hemispatial neglect, vision, is there any field cut, is there any hemianopia? We try to grade the power, how, how, how dense is the stroke, is the weakness, is the you know, one by five, five by five, uh, you, know, you try to grade that uh, uh, formally, you look for any loss of sensations, and then last but not the least, coordination and walking. 
Now, a number of stroke scales are there, which are used to, to basically to determine the severity of the stroke. So when you look at a stroke scale, the idea is you use a stroke scale to determine the severity of a stroke. And the most commonly used and the most well-validated stroke scale is the National Institute of Health stroke scale, the NIH SS stroke scale. Now, so the use of a stroke scale is highly recommended. If, if you look at the level of ev evidence, it's pretty high that we should, use, we should use a formal stroke scale when we encounter a stroke patient to determine the severity of the stroke. Now, all patients with acute ischemic stroke or acute stroke should receive an emergent brain imaging evaluation when they first arrive to the hospital before any treatment is started for the acute ischemic stroke. This is also important. Everybody needs some sort of imaging. You have to do at least, at least a basic CT scan. Now, systems should be in place so that these brain imaging studies, whether it's a CAT scan, whether it's the MRI, MRA, can be done quickly. Because remember, we're going to talk about this time is brain. You want to determine quickly if the candidate is a, if the patient is a candidate for IV thrombolytic therapy or mechanical thrombectomy or both. Now, a few things which will help you. A CT scan of the head without contrast is effective. It can be done to rule out intracranial hemorrhage before IV thrombolytic therapy. So you don't need an MRI of the brain. If you just do a CT scan of the head without contrast, it's only five minutes and there's no blood in the brain. You, that patient, you can give IV TPA. An MRI can also be done to exclude intracranial hemorrhage before IV TPA administration. And then you have advanced studies. I'm gonna talk about this, the role of a CTA, a CT angiography, CT perfusion studies, MR angiography, you know, different sequences like diffusion weighted imaging, MR perfusion studies. Now these are recommended in some patients. The whole idea is when you do these advanced imaging, you are able to identify few more patients who might meet the criteria for getting TPA. So talking about the National Institute of Health stroke scale, most commonly used, it's used to, to, to determine the severity of a stroke. So if you look at the NIH uh, stroke scale, a score of zero basically means a TIA. There are no signs of examination. A minor stroke will be between one to five. NIH stroke scale of six to 10 would, would indicate a moderate disabling stroke. 11 to 20 will be a moderate to severe. And when you have an NIH stroke scale of more than 20, you're talking about a severe life-threatening stroke. I'm not going to go over the scale, but just to complete the talk, I put up a slide of this, of this scale, how, it's, how, how, how the scale is scored, and you determine the number, and that tells how severe is the stroke. It's very helpful. Your, your resident, your fellow calls you in the night, tells you, I saw this patient, the patient's had a stroke, this is the NIH stroke scale, you cannot get a good idea what exactly how bad does the patient look. Now, apart from the NIH stroke scale, there are a number of other uh, stroke scales which are around. A lot of them are pre-hospital stroke scales. So they are done before the patient comes to the hospital. They're done here, at least in USA, by the EMS, by the ambulance people. So for example, if you look at the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, it's easy to do. It's only three items, takes less than one minute. But you know, there are some disadvantages. It does not give you the stroke severity. It's unable to look at for posterior circulation strokes. So all these different pre-hospital stroke scales are there as I've listed them out. Uh, some of them are easy to perform, but they're usually recommended for you know, the pre-hospital screening which has been done by the EMS people, the emergency medical personnel, the ambulance staff, which is doing that. And this is what the FAST uh, pre-hospital uh, scale looks like. Now coming to diagnostic tests. So when we talk about stroke, there are a number of tests we do. Broadly speaking, you can divide them into imaging, imaging tests, and then there are tests which are done to look at the blood flow of the brain. Most of these tests are simple, they're non-invasive. They're painless. And in talking about imaging studies, the major imaging studies, simple things, CT scan of the head, an MRI of the brain, a CT angiography, an MR angiography, those are the imaging studies. But when you're talking about blood flow tests, you might have something like a formal angiography for which you need to have an interventional neuroradiologist or interventional neurosurgeon, a vascular neurosurgeon who can do an, an angiogram for you in the middle of the night. 
very helpful when you're talking about, you know, intraarterial thrombolytic therapy, uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, if you're looking at aneurysms and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, I'm just using, going to use a few examples to highlight a point. So if you look at this slide, you have a CT scan of the head. It's showing a large stroke in the right middle cerebral artery distribution. You'll see the fact that the gray-white matter differentiation is gone. You'll see the, what is called the dense MCA sign kind of telling you that there's a clot sitting there in the middle cerebral artery. So that's like a CT scan. Advantage of doing a CT scan, easy to do, easily available. Takes only five minutes to do the scan and you get your results. And if it's negative, the patient might be a candidate for thrombolytic therapy provided he or she is in the right window period. Now you have further uh, advanced studies. For example, you're looking at CT perfusion. Now what's the advantage of doing these advanced studies is you'll see a part of the brain which is, which is not infarcted. It's, it's critically hypoperfused. It's functionally impaired. It's at a risk of getting a stroke if you don't do something. But so you're able to identify a part of the brain which might be salvageable. And that's the reason of doing these more advanced imaging CT perfusion studies where you can find out a part of the brain and you say, I think this a patient can still be helped. It's, it's not a completed stroke yet. If we do maybe intraarterial thrombolytic therapy, if we do a mechanical thrombectomy right now, this patient might be able to be, to be salvaged. Same thing, another slide looking at, you know, diffusion MRI, uh, you know, you see the diffusion weighted imaging changes. You're looking at subarachnoid hemorrhage. And here, for example, when you're looking at blood, CT scan is the best modality for looking at blood. You see a bleed in the, in, in the basal ganglia. Now, coming on to the management of stroke, the one thing which we all need to remember, it's been grilled into our head, but it's, it's actually right. When it comes to stroke, time is brain. Now, what does that mean? Really, what it all means is the benefits of, when you talk about the benefits of a TPA, one thing which is very important is TPA in patients with acute ischemic stroke is time dependent. And guidelines recommend that the door to needle time should be 60 minutes or less. So if you want a patient to get TPA and get benefited from TPA, your door to needle time should be less than 60 minutes. Now, what is a door to needle time? So if you look at the slide itself, Let's assume the patient in, arrives at the ER or the casualty, that's zero minute. And it's one hour since his, his, since his or her stroke symptoms started. You have the vital signs, you're taking the EKG within five minutes. A neurologist, the resident physician, senior resident has seen the patient within 10 minutes. You have got the CAT scan done, it's now around 25 minutes. If you need a Doppler ultrasound, that's done. PTPT INR has come back. Within 45 minutes, of the patient's arrival, you have a diagnosis. You know the patient has had a stroke and what kind of stroke has he had. And if it's a ischemic stroke and the, and the presentation is within three hours of symptom onset, well, the patient meets the criteria for TPA. If the patient does not meet the criteria for TPA, maybe intraarterial thrombolytic therapy is, is, is an option. So the whole idea is this, this door to needle time. The shorter it is, the better it is. In our hospital in Cornell, every weekend when we when the neurology chief residents send out an email, they always say, you know, they highlight the resident who had the who has the shortest door to needle time. So and so was able to get this thing done in 25 minutes. So this is something which is very important. This is something which every hospital has to kind of set up. How do you reduce the door to needle time in the patients who are presenting to our hospital with an acute ischemic stroke? Now, coming back to less we forget. So if you look at, uh, you know, it was around 1995, 1996 that the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke had the trials involving TPA uh, for the, as thrombolytic therapy. And that became the standard of care for acute ischemic stroke patients presenting within three hours. And more recently, it's become the standard of care for patients presenting within 4.5 hours of symptom onset. This was 1995, 1996, so a long time has gone by. Now, MRI, and I told you about the special MRI, CT perfusion studies, you might be able to identify the penumbra, which is, that, which, is a, which is a tissue at risk, but it's still salvageable. And if you're able to do that, you might be able to increase the yield of the lytic therapy, especially in the three to nine hours window period. Now, intraarterial thrombolytic therapy in the three to six hours window period may also offer moderate benefits 
when applied to patients who have potentially a large artery cerebral thrombotic occlusion. So the, you know, the, the, the goalpost has been moved further and further. Now, recent guidelines have come up that large vessel strokes can safely be treated with mechanical thrombectomy up to 16 hours after a stroke in some selected patients. And this is based on the DAWN and the diffuse three trials. So again, highlighting the fact how important it is to really catch them, give them the right treatment and the door to needle time I was talking about. So one thing which is very important for us to remember, especially when, if you are in India, is that while we have this TPA, be a mechanical thrombectomy, this has revolutionized the treatment for stroke, but it's only for the lucky few who reach the hospital in time. So there are two important things. You have to be a lucky person and you have to have reached the hospital in time. And I like to say that earlier on, you know, for stroke, people used to say neurologists cannot do anything. They basically just do supportive therapy. No, now no longer this is supportive or, or a ritualistic therapy. It's a pretty aggressive therapy. You are right there and you're trying to reverse the stroke and in fact, trying to salvage the brain. So this is where Dr. Nair is going to come in later on. Nowadays, when you look at stroke care, it's an interdisciplinary delivery of stroke care. So you have a patient who comes to the stroke center with a sub suspected stroke. The emergency measures are done. You have the strokes physician who's there. His or her role will be finding out the functional deficits localizing the lesion of the stroke, doing the imaging, determining if the patient is an IV TPA candidate or not. But equally important will be the cardiologist who will be working with the neurologist and his or her duty will be looking at the cardiovascular history, asking us, do we need any cardiac imaging? How do you determine the etiology of the stroke, especially if it's a cardioembolic stroke? And then you do an acute therapy, which if you decide to go with TPA, whether intra intravenous or intraarterial, you have, other, again, your colleagues involved, whether they'll be a vascular neurosurgeon, whether it's an interventional neuroradiologist, the ICU physician, and that, then you end up giving the treatment, and then the patient is transferred for the subacute therapy, which is usually in a stroke unit, and this is what it'll involve. Again, you'll have multidisciplinary doctors helping out. The neurologist will be managing the post-stroke complications, like post-stroke seizures, any other things which are coming up. The cardiologist is still involved. He or she might be helping us with determining what's the blood pressure management of this patient. If there's a cardiac injury, how do you manage the cardiac injury? If there's a, a comorbid cardiovascular uh, presentation like endocarditis, how do we take care of that? And then moving further, we go into stroke rehab, where then we have our rehab colleagues helping us. How do we maximize the physical and the neurocognitive recovery of our patient? Again, we are collaborating with, with a lot of the rehab doctors. So further emphasizing stroke is not just one field. It's not neurology, it's cardiology, it's rehab medicine, it's interventional neurosurgery, it's interventional neuroradiology. Lest we forget, on the picture there, I have a picture of our mobile stroke unit. It's a bus, as you can see, an ambulance. It has a CT scan mounted right inside the ambulance. So a lot of money has been invested to help increase TPA and mechanical thrombectomy use, mil billions of dollars. But in spite of that, the uptake is very modest, if, especially if you look at a country like India, only about 1% of acute stroke patients in developing countries are able to derive the benefits of IV TPA mechanical thrombectomy. And the reasons are not hard to find. You know, these facilities are available only in big stroke centers like big cities like probably New Delhi, Trivandrum, Chennai, you know, we, we lack supporting infrastructure. You need to have qualified stroke physicians, uh, cardiologists, stroke nurses, hospitals, stroke ambulances. And last but not the least, the main elephant in the room, cost, cost, cost. So coming back to this, what happens to the 97 to 99% of patients who, don't, who, who we cannot help with all these therapies? How do we take care of them? Few more slides. Prevention is better than cure. And on World Stroke Day, this is going to be my take home message. Prevention is better than stroke. Now, when you come to stroke prevention, what I think the one thing we all have to do as a group, we have to identify the core issues. And I've tried to list some of them. Ignorance. 
you'll be surprised how many people who are educated, middle class families, educated people, they have no knowledge of stroke risk factors. Then there are people who are very complacent. They just have a very complacent behavior. They'll ignore the stroke risk factors. They have hypertension. They don't care. They have hypertension. They have very poor lifestyle. They have poor health choices. They are smoking. They are drinking. They are chewing to tobacco. They have this feeling, it cannot happen to me. I'll just leave things in the hands of God. Ram Bharo say everything is going on fine. Then we'll have things like where there's poor control and management of these microvascular and macrovascular stroke risk factors. And then we all to be blamed for that. Maybe as doctors, we can do a better thing, be more aggressive in managing the hypertension, be more aggressive in managing their diabetes, their high cholesterol, if they have hypercoagulable risk factors, heart disease, if they have CHF, a AFib, patent for foramen ovale. Then, the, then the, another important point is poor compliance. Indian patients and patients around the world are notorious for being very poorly compliant with medication. They'll take that antiplatelet drug, they'll take the Plavix for some time, and then they'll stop it. They'll take the antihypertensive medicine, they'll be poorly compliant with the diabetic medications and the cholesterol-lowering medications. And then like a uh, very another important point is that in India, I feel very strongly that, and I come to India often, my father's a neurologist, you know, we lack the stroke aftercare infrastructure. We are still lacking in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, you know, maintain aspiration precautions. We can do a better job in treating the UTIs, the aspiration pneumonias, and all of this affects the morbidity and mortality of our patients. So we can, be, we can do a better job in trying to address these things. So in India, while we may not be able to improve the TPA rates, the mechanical thrombectomy rates, we can, however, address some of these above factors and lower the incidence and prevalence of stroke. So what are the Indian solutions? I use the word Jugar, and Jugar is actually a good word. If you look at Jugar, it basically mentions, the Wikipedia says it's a non-conventional, it's a frugal innovation. It's called as a hack. It's a simple workaround solution, something you do to, you know, on, with meager resources to tackle a big problem and you get good results. So what is the Indian Jugar? One Jugar will be, we, we kind of promote further the use of fixed drugs, those double and triple combination therapy, what are called combo drugs. For example, you have fixed dose combinations of etovastatin, which is a statin, along with aspirin, a statin and aspirin and Plavix, aspirin plus a statin, and then a, an ACE inhibitor like Ramipril or Enalapril in different doses. So you have a little bit of sort of, uh, you know, flexibility to adjust the dose. And the rational, rationale of using fixed dose combination therapy is that it has the potential to substantially increase the use of the medications in people who had a cardiovascular or a cerebrovascular event. So compliance, it really helps in compliance. These combinations are now available. They are widely used in many different countries. And the WHO since 2001 has been recommending the use of fixed drug combination therapies because it, it, it recognized pretty early the potential advantages of this, affordability, adherence. And so polypills, I just put in a study there from the American Heart uh, Journal in 2013. They looked at the combination therapy with these agents and they found that it led to a lower risk of vascular events and total mortality. So again, there's evidence to support the benefits of combination therapy. Last but not the least, a brain healthy diet. We are talking about prevention on World Stroke Day. On the slide, I have a Mediterranean diet to, uh, on the top and I have an Indian thali, a vegetarian thali, thali uh, 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 on the bottom. Normally, if you look at a, a Mediterranean diet, which is thought to be the most brain healthy diet, food is made in extra virgin olive oil. It recommends less of red meat, more of fish, less of carbohydrates, less of simple sugars, plenty of nuts, less of, uh, you know, quit smoking, quit tobacco, plenty of vegetables. And if you're drinking, maybe red wine in moderation is better. Now, an Indian diet is definitely not a Mediterranean diet, but Indian diet can be very vegetarian. And with a little bit modifications in our patient's diet, we can make the diet really healthy. We can do a better job in even getting a brain healthy diet, which becomes more the norm for us going forward. Last slide, we never should forget other factors like psychosocial factors, if there's stress in a patient's life, address the stress. Use of supplements, which are thought to be brain healthy, like magnesium, B12, 
omega-3 fatty acids, sleep. Sleep is thought to be very restorative for the brain. Indians, you know, we have central obesity. When you see a patient who's obese, think about sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is nowadays thought to be a risk factor for stroke. Relatively easy to identify, relatively easy to treat with a CPAP. And then obviously the role of regular physical exercise. I'll end by saying we need to do education, education, education. That's what the whole idea of the World Stroke Day is. We need to educate everybody. What is a stroke? How do you identify the stroke? And what do you do when you have a stroke? Because remember, time is brain. Brain is time when it comes to a stroke. And I'll stop here. It's World Stroke Day. I thank uh, Pharma Mankind for allowing me to talk to you. And I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Sethi, for that uh, true neurology polypill for the treatment of stroke, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, give me a moment's time. By the time I share my screen. Yeah, there we go. Sharing is paused. Stop share. Is my screen visible and am I audible? Uh, sir, screen is not yet uh, visible, sir. Yeah, yeah, now it's Yeah, yeah, now, now, now it's visible, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Those are my disclosures. Uh, so, you know, that is a picture from uh, the Washington Post uh, where they featured this gentleman. Uh, his, uh, his name is Rodney. Rodney is standing second in that picture with his cardiac team who did an PCI foreign myocardial infarction. And then he came into the news because he was running the Boston Marathon post PCI, right? Michael infarction, heart attack, and he had an angioplasty done, right? So from Boston to Bombay, Mumbai, um, look at those two people. They both had uh, CABG done in India and they are on their morning jogging. So whether you're looking at uh, Boston Marathon or, or, or Bombay, Mumbai, a commoner, you see that today the treatment of myocardial infarction, heart attack, has tremendously changed and gives our patients a quality of life which we could not even imagine a couple of years back. Now, in contrast, in contrast, it is so very easy for us to find out a patient who is a neurologist referral. Right. In our crowded OPD, it is very easy to spot the lady in wheelchair who is a referred patient from neurology. Now think about it. It's something very interesting. On one side, we have the brain. On one side, we have the heart. The, the, the villain is same. Under scanning electron microscope, you can see a platelet thrombus there stuck onto the endothelium. If you look into the pathology, it's same. That's a small vessel almost near total occlusion by the clot. So pathology looks same, the, the villain looks same, but so much of a difference it makes. It makes a difference between the recovery where most people come and ask us, how long can I jog, can I swim, can I run? Versus a large number of patients who have a suboptimal recovery and end up with debility. So despite heart attack and uh, stroke are uh, resulting from, let's say, ischemic, we uh, take away the hemorrhagic stroke, uh, we see a totally different outcome of this disease. And in fact, if you look at the data, this is uh, the global burden of disease on uh, stroke data that came in Lancet in 2019. This is the GBD data 2016. Now, if you look into the data, there are two letters there, YLD and YLL. YLL is years of life lost. Okay, so let's say in a community, you have a person whose life expectancy at birth is 70. He dies at 60. So that 10 years of loss, that is called YLL or years of life lost. 
In contrast, YLD is years lived with disability. Let us say this patient becomes disabled because of a stroke at 40. So that 40 to 50, he is still alive, but he is disabled. That is YLD or years lived with disability. To commoners, let us say, let us say uh, the, the, the red line below is YLD. Uh, that is mortality. Right. And the red line, the blue line is YLL, disability. So you see the, the, the numbers, it is not just mortality, but the disability that is so very huge, which results from stroke. The blue line is disability and the red line is mortality. The blue disability is huge. And that is what makes stroke so very different stroke disables and that is why it is important that we need to prevent stroke as much as possible so that brings us to the importance of why a cardiologist is talking about stroke prevention now if you tell me that i want to read one simple article about the education of uh, primary and secondary prevention of ischemic stroke and cerebral hemorrhage that's what we are talking about i would recommend this article by diner and Hanke, Diner is from Germany, uh, and uh, uh, Hanke, Grim Hanke is uh, from Perth, uh, Australia. This article very clearly tells us the moment, the, the, the points that we need to learn from this entire lecture. So let us spend a minute and a half on this slide. Patients with TIA or ischemic stroke, what do we do to prevent another stroke? Number one, lifestyle. Okay. That is education, treatment targets, weight loss, physical activity, stop smoking, reduce alcohol. Okay, Dr. Sethi told you so beautifully about all that, right? Next is hypertension. Most important, treat to target 140, less than 140 over 90. If the blood pressure is high, it's high risk for stroke. Point number three, lipids. Treat to target, keep an LDL to below 70. We were talking about a goal of 100 till a couple of years back. Today, we talk about a goal of less than 70. Next, diabetes. It is important that we keep diabetes under control. So lifestyle, hypertension, lipids, diabetes. These are the basic tenets of control of risk factors, the traditional risk factors for a cardiovascular disease, right? And that brings us to Antiplatelet therapy. Dr. Seti told you about dual antiplatelets, combinations, very important. And depending on the situation you talk about, don't forget about antiplatelets. Cardiac embolisms. We need to think about oral anticoagulants. Today, we talk all talk and use NOAX, and we have to keep that in mind. Occasional patient might benefit by a left atrial occlusion, occlusive devices. If we are talking about an embolic stroke of unknown source, we call it ESUS. Embolic stroke of unknown source, we don't know from where, the embolus came and we talk about aspirin. Patent foramen ovale is becoming an important talking point. Many patients might have a stroke with um, nothing obvious, but a patent foramen ovale. It's a gap between the atrial septum. Normally the blood flows from left to right, but in times during Valsalva, a little bit of blood and some clots might flow from right to left and create a systemic embolism. We can go ahead today and close our PFO. We'll spend a little moment, little some time on that. Symptomatic carotid stenosis, carotid endarterectomy or stenting depending on how severe and how bad they are. And finally, intracranial stenosis or vertebral stenosis would be a medical treatment. So on one side, we have lifestyle, we have the antiplatelets. We have the uh, we have to keep our eyes open for cardiac embolism, the unknown strokes, the PFO, and of course the vascular stenosis. Now, in this same article, there's something very interesting. I mean, this is the data from the interstroke. These are all the risk factors for stroke, right? Let us make it simple. Look at all the risk ratios, RRs, 
for stroke, you have a huge number of them, diet, based in my psychological smoking. And Dr. Sethi actually talked about all that. Now, if you look at those numbers, the one that has maximum value, 2.86, is cardiac causes, AFA, myocardial infarction, rheumatic valvular disease, peripheral vascular disease. Okay, so vascular disease, cardiac disease, ranks one of the highest in the inter-heart study as a risk factor responsible for stroke. This is not inter-heart, but inter-stroke study, right? 2.86. So you understand why the cardiologist comes in here. And then if you look at the first ever stroke in this analysis, again, looking at the relative risk reduction. So if we do something, the first stroke risk comes down. And again, look at those numbers. The highest one risk reduction is anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. AFib is so very important. So if our patient has an AFib, and if I properly treat it with an anticoagulation, the stroke risk substantially comes down. Which stroke? The very first stroke. Okay, so there's no point in treating a patient who already has developed a stroke. He has a weakened side, he can't walk, he's disabled. So if this patient doesn't, if this many physicians fail to understand, they take it casually. But if we have a patient of atrial fibrillation, his risk chance of getting a first stroke is high. We need to put him in a chat vasc or a chat score and then put him on a proper anticoagulation. And that is very vital. What about a recurrent stroke? In the same analysis, you see that if you look at the relative risk, the highest is again anticoagulation for AFib. So that tells us that anticoagulation, AFib, is so very important. And that brings us where I stand in this lecture. I mean, you would say that Dr. Sethi is a neurologist and he talked about it. What are you doing here? This is what I'm doing here. The role of cardiologist in stroke prevention. This was a beautiful article that came in 2017 in the ESC journal. Uh, 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 this is from uh, Dr. Wildimsky from the Czech Republic. Very beautiful article. And I, I would show you a couple of slides from this article. And one of them, the one that I like most, highlights the point we are going to talk about. So he is talking about what the cardiologist is doing in stroke. So if you look at those red points, red bullets, they are AFib and hypertension. So AFib and hypertension stands out by something that the cardiologists need to take care so that the patient doesn't get his first stroke. And even if he gets a first stroke and a TIA, doesn't get a recurrence. Hypertension, we, we, we are aware that it can cause frank strokes. It can be responsible for these white matter lesions. It can be responsible for slow blood flow, atrial fibrillation. We know hypertensive patients are more prone for AFib. And they, in the long run, can develop heart failure. And those can reduce vascular supply to the brain and create cerebral ischemia. So we are talking about a frank stroke with a motor and sensory impairment. We are talking about vascular dementia. You know, many people don't, 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 don't understand that vascular dementia starts very, very slowly. In fact, in our cardiology OPD, today we look for vascular dementia. And when we find that if they have hypertension, we put them on an ambulatory BP because many of them turn out to have something called a masked hypertension. So in your office, their blood pressure may be something like 140 or 90, but if you put them on an ambulatory BP, you would see that at night they have significant hypertension. And unless you treat that, their dementia is going to progress. At a time when we see them, you put them on a minimental scale, you'll find that they have slight dementia, right? The wife says that my husband forgets where he put his keys, forgets about birthdays or, or uh, car keys and mobile phones. But that, if that patient has a nocturnal masked hypertension, unless you treat it, it's going to end up in a true vascular dementia and, of course, a cognitive impairment. Now, from Hypertension, the other major factor we know is AFib, atrial fibrillation. Many people don't understand that atrial fibrillation, the very presence of atrial fibrillation increases stroke risk by five times, five times higher. So if your resident shows you an ECG that shows an AFib, think in your mind that your patient has a five times higher chance of stroke and a double the mortality, five times stroke and twice the mortality just because he has AFib. 
25% of AFib patients are asymptomatic. You pick up AFib in the ECG and tell them there's an irregularity, you'll say, oh, doctor, I feel fine. Okay, 25% are paroxysmal. That is an even big problem, a bigger problem because when you take an EKG, their EKG is fine. And when you examine them, they're fine, but they might have proximal AF when they're at home or they are asleep. So unless you do a prolonged Holter monitor, maybe 24 hours or even 72 hours or even a week, you may miss out a proximal AFib and they might end up in a stroke. Young strokes, do not forget that AFib is an important reason for young stroke. And finally, insidious heart failure. Many patients would just come and say that, uh, doctor, now I can't really climb three floors. And recently I find even one floor is difficult. You do an echocardiogram. Uh, may, they may be their, their ejection fraction is near normal or slightly depressed. You can't find any so cause. You do an angiogram, it's normal. They might have proximal atrial fibrillation. And that might be responsible for the progressive worsening of heart failure, tachycardia induced heart failure. Now we know that today we have NOACs, right? And NOACs are something that has given us a tremendous advantage, better than VKA, uh, efficacy wise better than warfarin, safer than VKA, safer than warfarin, no need for monitoring PTINR, but then in Indian setting they're costly because in India hospitalization uh, uh, is not very costly, testing is not very costly, but the drug is, is costly. Uh, this is a very interesting data that came uh, in the ESC journal that talks about a film in India, low and middle income countries. Now, this is something very thought provoking and interesting. Look at the data. If you look at the number of deaths created by atrial fibrillation, Look at that. If you look at the lower middle country that is in uh, orange, you see that graph is the highest. Now, it's not the lower, lowest income. It's not the highest income. In fact, the low and the high are almost same bottom there. Why the high and low are there? Low is not much higher in incidence because lower income countries, the food is bad, they have to work hard and there is no much risk of atherosclerotic vascular disease. In contrast, the lower middle countries have access to fast food, cheaper food, which is not good for health. They have access to mechanized transport. Everybody in India has a bike, right? So you don't walk and smoking is rampant. So you have smoking, you have fast food, you have access to fast food, you have good income, and you don't exercise much because India is a country, it's a hub for IT now. So all young men and women sit in front of computers and work, they don't uh, exercise. And of course, everybody has a mechanical transport, you don't exercise. That's the reason why. And of course, high, high income countries, US, they're all reading about good health. Everybody's talking about good health, they have good health insurance, they're talking about diet, they do exercise. So it is the lower middle countries that are in real trouble. Not just that, look at the Delhi. There's a disability adjusted life years, which is a combination of YLL and the YLD that we just saw. And you find that uh, again, Delhi is higher. Not the lowest income country, not the high income country, but the lower middle income country. So understand that we have a truly big problem and a special problem with us. And the other problem that people don't realize is this, decadal growth in population. This is the decadal growth in population, not just absolute growth, but decadal growth in India. Now look at that. Actually, if you see the total population, India's decadal growth is coming down. Not the absolute number of population, but the rate of growth is coming down in the past two decades or so. But in contrast, if you look at the red line, the elderly population is going up because we have better health facility, people are living longer, the quality of life is better, people are living to longer and longer age. Today in this state of Kerala, the life expectancy at birth of a lady is 
81.3 years, almost matching that of people, or ladies who live in New York, right? 81 years. So a Kerala lady today has a life expectancy of 81 years. And that is fascinating. So we are becoming a population which is a large number of elderly people in India. Okay, that is on one side. Now, on the other side, if you look at the rheumatic heart disease data, look at that American map, right? I'm sure that uh, Dr. Seti doesn't see in rheumatic heart disease, uh, uh, maybe he can see maybe one or twice a year. But look at the Indian map. On one side, okay, the growth rate or the, or the increasing number of rheumatic heart disease is somewhere there, less than five to 10% color wise. But you see that dark blob, we have a huge burden of rheumatic heart disease still left in India, who had a rheumatic fever maybe three decades back and have, has a rheumatic valve disease now. Okay, so we have on one side, a rheumatic valve disease population who are younger, who has a fib, you know, cardiology, interestingly in AFib, while you also have an elderly population burden coming up in states like Kerala, who has also a fib. So we have kind of double geopardy. So this, see, this is our own, our own registry. We call, this was published, uh, Kerala Atrial Fibrillation Registry. There are two registries, Kerala Atrial Fibrillation Registry and the Heart Failure Registry of Toronto, uh, which, which, which uh, came in the American Heart Journal. Now, see, the Kerala Heart Failure Registry, our data shows something unusual. It shows that if you look at hospitalization, a substantial number of people of AF are below the age of 50. But at the same time, if you see the total number, they peak around about 60 to 70. So on one side, we have a peak of elderly population with AFib, exactly like what New York or US sees. On the other hand, we are finding still people who are young, have a rheumatic heart disease and AFib. And all this AFib, whether it's rheumatic or ischemic, doesn't matter. They have a five time higher risk of what stroke. And that's what we are talking today in the World Stroke Day. AFib in India, so we have a 45% incidence among those who are more than 70 years. So if you take from our data, people who are more than 70 years, about 45% incidence of AFib, but earlier age of onset of AF. So we have a double problem, right? That's what we are trying to say. And change of AF from valvular to non-valvular. Why? We have a lot of valvular still left there. So, so it's a combination of two bad things, but valvular AF still remains 27% in our registry. Now, talking about MOAX, the ESC journal very clearly today says that uh, uh, vitamin K antagonists are today reserved only for those who have a mechanical prosthetic valve. You have a metal valve there, you need to give warfarin. Okay, if you have a moderate to severe mitral valve stenosis, you need to give a vitamin K antagonist warfarin. For everything else where you need an anticoagulation, whether you have mild to moderate other valve disease, bioprosthetic valve, mitral valve repair, PTAV or TAV, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and of course the entire arena of people with ischemic AFib, we can prescribe NOAX for them. So NOAX has changed their, their profile from where they were just indicated for ischemic AFib, they're indicated for all kinds of AFib, accepting mechanical processes and severe mitral stenosis for treatment and prevention of stroke. Now, this is a beautiful article about cryptogenic stroke and patent for an oil. We should spend a minute or two on PFO, patent for an oil before we close. Patent for an oil, as you can see there in that TEE picture, is a small gap in the atrial septum. On that picture there you see, what you see on the left of your screen is right atrium and right is the left atrium. And that gap there in that white area, I have marked it with the arrow, is the atrial septal defect. It's not a true defect, but a flap valve kind of defect, which we call as patent foramen ovale. Now, if a patient has a patent foramen ovale, there's a chance that material from right atrium during Valsalva maneuver during straining at stools or even laughing, coughing, or day-to-day -day activities might go from right to left, embolize and create a stroke. 
Okay, so patent for a novel needs to be kept in mind and that is how a patent for a novel looks like. Today, we can use an umbrella device and close it non-invasively and make sure that the patent for a novel goes away. So the question comes in, which patient needs a closure for a novel? Because if you do a routine echocardiogram for healthy people, you find about 15% of people have a, a, a foramen oval, patent foramen oval in all the echoes that we do. So do we go ahead and, and close every foramen oval? Not, not necessarily. And this should be, you know, when people looked at the data of closing foramen oval in patients who had a stroke and looking at recurrent stroke prevention, see that all trials, close, respect, reduce, PC, closure, everything shows that there's benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.42 and a very tight, fairly tight conference interval, which means that you do benefit. If there is a stroke, there are no other obvious causes. I repeat, no other obvious causes for stroke, no AFib, no clot scene, no other obvious reasons for AFib, I mean, uh, uh, for a uh, uh, stroke. Go ahead and close the foramen away and you will benefit. Now, there is small flip side that as you close with the closure device, you have a chance of slightly increased atrial fibrillation and flutter. That is because you're putting a foreign material in the atrial septum and that is snug fit onto the defect. So obviously a mechanical compression creates an idea for arrhythmias, but that arrhythmia is normally short lasting, few days and it goes away and does not really create much of thromboembolism. So there is a statistically significant increase in atrial fibrosis. So it is important that we decide who should we send for a device closure for a PFO. So I think uh, at the end, this is extremely important. Let us spend a minute and take this on because it is extremely important. So let us say a person whose biological age is less than 60, meaning that he is fine. He might be more than 60, but he is fine, fit and runs around, he is not frail and he has an ischemic stroke, and you do an echo, and you find there is a patent for a novel. So this is a gentleman who is less than 60, who has a stroke and a patent for a novel, right? So first thing is look for a large artery atherosclerosis. Is there a large artery gross atherosclerotic plaque? Because that might have embolized. Second, look for a cardioembolic soap. Look into the heart for LV clot or the LA clot. Look for an arterial dissection somewhere and look for a hypercoagulable state. So you're looking for a source of thrombus in the heart, a source of plaque in the artery, a source of plaque in the arterial wall, a dissection, a hypercoagulable blood, or maybe a large artery thrombosis or a small artery defect. Now, if you don't find any of those, okay, you don't find any of those, then look for the standard risk factors. Is there hypertension uncontrolled? Is there uncontrolled diabetes? Is there autoimmune disease? Is there excess use of drugs or alcohol abuse? Drugs like cocaine can cause, give rise to arterial uh, thrombus and, and, and vasospasm, right? So you look for sources of thrombus inside artery, inside the heart. You look for risk factors. If still the answer is no, look for atrial fibrillation. You, your patient might still be in sinus rhythm, person is normal, put on a Holter monitor for 70 hours if needed, you are suspecting even for a week and find out is there atrial fibrillation or flutter. Now, if that answer is still no, then think about the patient's condition. Is it that the patient is extremely ill and he would not live more than one year? Does he have end-stage heart disease, lung disease, cancer, a cardiac tumor, endocarditis, septicemia, or severe valvular pathology? Right. Now, in any of these boxes, if any of them take yes, don't send them for PFO closure. Send them for a medical therapy. So if you have a large artery atrial thrombosis, a cardiac source of thrombus, a small vessel disease, arterial dissection, hypercolloidal state, or a host of risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune disease, drug abuse, or you have a clear atrial fibrillation, either by the EKG or a Holter monitor, or you think the patient is not going to live long, he has a terminal heart, lung, pulmonary disease, or an end-stage cancer, no PFO closure. All these patients go for medical therapy. And if the answer is still no, 
then you think about PF occlusion. So very clear, look for sources of thrombus, look for multiple risk factors, look for AFib, look for the general big picture. If everything is negative, you think about PF occlusion. Couple of points that enhances reasons for going for PF occlusion are number one, prior venous thromboembolism, which means you have a right-sided thrombus, there's a chance that this might cross over from RA to LA and cause a systemic thrombosis, systemic embolism. Second, multifocal cerebral defects. You have a shower of embolus and you can't find anything anywhere. You're suspecting this might be uh, embolism crossing through the PFO. You have a largish PFO or a true atrial septal aneurysm because of lack of time, I'm not showing you a cause of atrial septal aneurysm, but there might be atrial septal aneurysms, which actually forms a nidus for a clot. And of course, eustachian valves or Chiari network. These are small uh, networks of mesh seen in the right atrium. They are remnants of the, of the uh, valve inside the uh, right atrium, and they can be a source of trauma. So if they are there, it forms an additional risk for PFO. Finally, stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation, looking forward. We need to look forward, right? And we have so many trials that are just coming in. And you know, you see, we did not stop short at 2000, but open up, up to, you have trials planned up to 2030. And basically you can see three clear streams, the top line of trials, like the LAAOS, the closure AF, the AMOLET, uh, the ASAP, the WAVE, and the occlusion AF trial are basically about LA appendage occlusion devices. So if you have a, a, a stroke and no other source or an AF, you occlude the left atrium by a device, like a watchman device, what we get today. Then the, we have the NOAA trials, the Invectors, the Pacific AF, the NOAA, the Atticus, the NOAA trials. And of course, we have the monitoring trials. Either you put in a loop monitor, a long-term monitor, uh, or devices to monitor therapy. That is monitoring trials, and we would all wait for the results. And that just reminds me that, uh, do remember that uh, this randomized double-blind trial involving 20,000 patients was conducted over a period of 10 years. So a lot of, lot of good trials come, huge database, long period of, uh, of, of trial. But then at the end, unfortunately, we have forgotten why we did it, right? Why did we do it? So sometimes it is, it is funny that we forget why we did a huge trial. And at the end, there's a story of uh, one of our patients who got a gift from his daughter. The daughter came from New York uh, and gifted him an Apple Watch. This gentleman had a small stroke, recovered. We did everything. We could not find anything, not even PFO. Right? So we put him on aspirin and we said it must be a stroke of unknown source. We really don't know. And then after he wore the gift one day, he came back and said, this is last year, uh, doctor, my Apple watch showed something unusual. I recorded the EKG and it showed that, you know, a minute before it showed a normal sinus rhythm. And when I recorded this, AFib. So what are we talking about? We are talking about AFib, which is device detected. So device detected, AFib today is becoming common. Okay, not just in New York, but it's random too. People would come and tell you in any part of India that I have an Apple Watch and I have picked up that I have got an AFib. Many often it might be a mechanical uh, problem. It might be an electronic problem. It might not be actual AFib, but this was a true AFib. How long should an AFib remain for us to say it is significant? At least 30 seconds. Well, whether you consider anticoagulation depends on what background you're talking, whether the patient had a, a, a stroke or a TIA, or you think that he has a high risk is a different question. But if it is more than 30 seconds of persistent AF device detected, you call, talk, you, you call it a device detected AF. So at the end of all this, in conclusion, where are we in stroke prevention in 2021 from the cardiology perspective? Point number one, we should all try to reduce C virus factor. You have seen that Oxeti and me, we are talking about the same thing. So cardiology, neurology, radiology, uh, epidemiologists, uh, GPs, same thing. We are trying to reduce stroke risk by reducing the risk factors. Lipids, smoking, diabetes, hypertension. So make people aware that they need to reduce risk. Try to find out AFib. Many of your patients might not have an AFib right up front. But if you're suspecting AFib, put them on a long-term Holter monitor today in India. 72-hour uh, Holter monitors are very cheap. They're available for about 
three to four thousand rupees is just a patch put a patch and say, pair their cell phone with the patch and send them home they they can take bath with the patch that's not an issue because you know previously we found the patients used to come and ask us oh, doctor so i can't take bath you know indian patients are very very finicky about taking bath right so you can say yes you can have bath oh fine so they put it and go and we pick up so many fabs whereby our plan of strategy of treatment of prevention on a, of of stroke changes pfo if you don't find major risk factors don't find a fib you find a young person there is no source for embolus his heart is fine his arteries are fine there is no dissection there is no hypercoagulability you still are getting a uh, a uh, stroke and there is in pfo think about pfo device closure and finally over time as we learn and share our learnings i think we are moving from confusion to clarity whether you are in new york or whether you are hail from the small town of trivandrum but the point is uh, we look forward to a day when exactly like dr sethi said some day we may be able to put a cath lab like the ct scan in an ambulance and send it to a patient home thank you for your time and i give back the screen to the organizers thank you sir thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation and uh, uh, i can see dr sethi is also logged in so uh, dr sethi is it possible for you uh, to come online sir i'm sorry dr agarwal can you repeat that oh no no i was just asking if uh, will it be okay for you to take the uh, few questions sure sure i'm here okay okay sir that's great so uh, so uh, so dr nair sir uh, so shall we uh, proceed with the questions sure so uh, there is one question specifically to dr sethi uh, uh, sir excellent presentation uh, my query is regarding the modifications you mentioned are required in the indian diet to make it a brain healthy diet <laughs> uh, that's a good question and that's reason i put that slide up uh you know i mean we really have not looked at a brain healthy indian diet and that's what i think we should do as dr nayar said we have to work collaboratively and stroke prevention is the way to go and on world stroke day that's maybe one thing which we should all study what how can we modify the indian diet to become a brain healthy diet a heart healthy diet now i sometimes see these videos on facebook on street food in india some of them is really scary the, the chunks of amul butter lot of oil i mean and that's not how food is usually made at, at our homes but you know a little i personally feel a little modification of the indian diet can make it even healthier than the diet what we have right now and we can kind of strive to have a diet which is brain healthy heart healthy because the heart and the brain are very closely connected what's healthy for the brain is healthy for the heart what's healthy for the heart is healthy for the brain so i think it can be done it needs people to get uh, you know get involved a few studies and then we come out with a brain healthy indian diet thank you sir can i can uh, i add something yeah 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 please sir. i think it's an excellent uh, you know uh, answer that dr sethi said i think it's very right because people come and ask us the same question in a different way they ask us that uh, can, doctor can you tell us what is heart unhealthy diet right now the i think the, the problem in indian diet is not excess of fat we don't okay we take daldas and ghee and all that butter but then it's not an excess of fat it's also not a large dose of non veg diet but our problem is excess of carb okay so what happens is whether you are a rice eater or whether i eat dosa or idli in the south indian diet or you eat puris or chapatis see our diet is all all packed up with carb carb and that huge amount of carb see if i take a lesser amount of uh, uh, rice at home my mom and my wife feels that oh my god uh, uh, i am starving right they said this is why you are looking thin and you know i am sure of sethi's mom also tell the same thing that eat more rice what is this you know they are not bothered whether you skip whatever you need to eat more carb so i think we should cut down on carb because carb is what gives rise to triglycerides and it's a triglyceride that drives see if you have a triglyceride of more than 177 and if you have a waist size of more than 90 centimeters 
you know that is what drives the indian risk factor right that is the the, the thin outside fat inside india you know india in india if you try to look at the uh, bmi in fact uh, last week i wrote an article about the bmi its importance in in indian ethnicity in the journal of american college of cardiology just last week it came and we we had discussed the problems of 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 bmi in indian population your bmi for all of us here would be fine but if you look at the bell size of your patient if it is more than 90 cm and if his triglyceride is more than 177 you are dealing with a very early metabolic syndrome and by that definition a lot of us would turn out to be unhealthy thank you sir uh, sir like uh, next question is uh, to dr nayar sir uh, sir can statins be given immediately after stroke oh sure see the the point is any uh, cardiovascular atherosclerotic accident be it a stroke or be it an myocardial infarction uh we uh, should give statins now the question probably is that how quickly we should give uh perhaps the answer is as quickly as possible uh, uh there was one trial called spiracle trial with atorvastatin high dose which had shown that uh, uh atorvastatin had slightly increased the cerebral beats but subsequent trials very very clearly if the gentleman who is asking question is thinking about that has shown that early statins after stroke does not harm at all in fact you should start statins exactly you start after myocardial infarction load them quickly with statins and a good dose of statin not a 10 mg atorvastatin but 80 mg atorvastatin or 40 mg atorvastatin so the two statins available in india as quickly as possible as soon as the patient comes and it does not increase the chance of cerebral hemorrhage thank you sir if i uh, so if the, i may say so yeah. dr agarwal my mother and my wife they want me to eat more i don't eat enough Just, just so they are always telling me eat more rice i think i don't think so indian diet is unhealthy i think as dr nair is saying a balanced diet i feel is is the way to go extremes of everything is bad so you know if you have a diet which is very extremely carbohydrate based diet it's probably not good for you so i think as long and one of the thing about diet which i have realized easy to talk very hard to implement you have to have a diet which is palatable which people can afford i'll tell you a very simple thing which in, in new york always fascinates me you go to kfc in new york your mcdonalds you will get a whole bucket of chicken for a few dollars a salad costs much more than that why healthy food nowadays is become more expensive than unhealthy food which is fast food and unfortunately i think in india we are going to probably have an uh, you know heart disease and strokes increasing because of the younger population's diet is changing and changing rapidly thank you sir uh, sir uh, dr sethi the next question is uh, for you i guess uh, a patient of stroke develops convulsions so is anti epileptic to be given if yes for how long that's an excellent question and thank you for asking that i'm an epileptologist so post stroke seizures are common they may occur in the immediate after setting of a stroke that means let's assume you had a stroke and right after that soon after that the patient has his first seizure the usual practical approach is you cover them with an anticonvulsant because a seizure is not good in stroke recovery you can use a broad spectrum anticonvulsant levotracetam is very good any broad spectrum anticonvulsant valproic acid cheap very good you cover them with a broad spectrum anticonvulsant my approach is let them stay on that for about 3 to 6 months some point once the acute stroke has passed they are doing rehab they are recovering you you know you do an eeg study you try to find out do they have an underlying seizure potential you know is there misfiring coming from the brain and then you make a call whether you want to continue the anticonvulsant therapy or you want to stop it so that's the way i would approach it thank you sir uh, dr nayar uh, sir uh, for uh, this question is for you sir uh, if there was a strong family history of uh, vascular events like thrombotic cva and or cad then how to prevent getting stroke in the other members of him uh, see we always uh, give an example that if you know uh, there are a group of people called pima indians right pima indians come from the southwestern uh, us 
Uh, Pima Indians have a very high incidence of diabetes. That's why every diabetic conference you see pictures of Pima Indians. Now, Pima Indians, if you see, uh, they were not from actually uh, the Western uh, the uh, Arizona region. Uh, they actually came from the uh, much, much, much down uh, uh, south. Okay. Now, if you see those who remain much south, they still do very hard work. So their lifestyle is different. So in a, in a unique uh, study that came in the, the Journal of Diabetes, they looked into the Pima Indians who still continue to do hard work and farming who are far down south versus the Pima Indians who have crossed the border from Mexico and come on to uh, Arizona, right? So the Arizona Pima and the, the, the Nevada Pimas, they, they are, they are, they are, their genetics are identical, but if you look at their lifestyle, they're different. And while the Arizona Pimas uh, have a 30%, uh, 25 to 30% chance of diabetes, it's about 3% uh, for the Nevada uh, uh, Pimas. So, which means that it is not just what is in our genes. A genetic, uh, what is written in our genes is important, but what translates onto a disease depends on very many things, including our quality of life, including the environment which we live and including what we are now talking about something called epigenetics right we should understand this that genes cannot be rewritten right they are very solid so that's the benefit of uh, genes you know they are digital so even if you take from a crime scene some years back you can make out the what the genetic code is right the genes are the dnas that their dnas don't get spoiled but when we see that element of gene that are wound around the histones that is where epigenetics work. So epigenetics actually makes a genetic signal manifest, right? My skin cell can also manufacture serotonin. It doesn't because it is inhibited there. And that change at histone can come in your own lifetime. So suppose I do regular exercise so that we know that there is methylation of the genes at histone, which can prevent the bad genes from manifesting either diabetes or stroke or atherosclerotic vascular disease in me. So I can still remain healthy if my cholesterol is down, my, my diabetes is not manifest, I watch my weight, weight and I do regular exercise and don't smoke. So simply because you have a family risk factor, family history, doesn't mean that you are doomed. So the point is take care of other risk factors. You can't obviously change your parentage, but take care of your other risk factors, do frequent checks. And if indicated, probably your threshold for starting statins would be extremely low. In fact, if I see that there are more than two members, two or more members in the family, that means uh, father, mother, brother, sister, sub and children suffering by atherosclerotic vascular disease, we always put them on statins because statins are clearly protective in this background. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Siddhi, the uh, next question, uh, please tell thrombolysis can be helpful in posterior circulation strokes, mainly cerebellar. I think the answer to that, uh, you know, it's a very technical question. Thrombolysis, the, the, what I really wanted to tell for my presentation is thrombolysis is an option for large vessel strokes, even the posterior circulation. The idea is that one, we should try to get a little bit more used to these new imaging modalities which are there. Uh, like I talked about the CTA, that I talked about the CT perfusion, because that really will help us determine who is the right candidate? And then we have the option of pursuing either thrombolysis, intravenous, intraarterial, or thrombolytic therapy. So the answer is large vessel strokes. We are really nowadays pushing the, uh, you know, the window period. It's becoming more and more longer. I think we pretty much have something to offer to a lot of stroke patients, no matter what the time of stroke onset. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Nair, uh, I guess this is probably the last question, sir. Uh, if phenofibrates control both cholesterol and triglycerides, so is there any need to add statins? Uh, the answer is two part. One, phenofibrate don't have much effect on LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol. It uh, reduces triglyceride by different mode of action, unlike statins, number one. So the second thing is that our aim is not just to reduce number. Let's say I give you a drug that reduces your blood sugar from 120 to 110. Okay, but is that your goal? Right, no. You want to say that stroke should be prevented, a heart attack should be prevented, or a symptom or a sign of a cardiac disease should abate, 
or not increase at least. Now the problem with fibrates is such a data does not exist. There are small data in a court trial, for example, if you see those who had a high triglyceride and a low HDL, they tended to have benefit with, with phenofibrate. But the point is, there is no clear data analyzed statins that fibrates by reducing triglyceride do any good by preventing an event. And that is the real challenge. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir, with this, uh, we are nearing the uh, end of uh, our this stroke summit. And uh, so on uh, behalf of Mankind Pharma, I thank you both of our speakers, uh, Dr. Nair, sir, and Dr. Sethi, sir, uh, for the wonderful uh, presentations and uh, handling all the, all the queries uh, from, uh, from our audience. And due to paucity of time, we could not take all the queries. So I really apologize for that uh, because there were so many queries, so which actually shows uh, the interest of the audience also. So, uh, so sir, I thank you uh, all for joining us here on this stroke day, World Stroke Day. And I hope uh, you, are, uh, you must have got uh, some uh, practical information which we can all utilize in our day-to-day -day practice. So thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Prashant, for organizing it so well and, and moderating this session so well. And thanks and uh, good morning to Dr. Sethi. As we all sign off, uh, take care, keep safe. Thank you, sir. My pleasure.